I'm leaving home for the coastline Someplace under the sun I feel my heart for the first time Okay, so what... How was your day? What was the main experience in your mind today? Day one. <laughs> That's exactly why I'm asking. Yeah. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Day one, my, my teacher would call it the first day blues because it's a little bit of adjustment and you know it's a lot to take in you're coming in from everybody here is coming in from very different places for one thing and we're coming into retreat and then we're leaving the world leaving everything else outside and usually we're used to kind of engaging in so many things and you know we have a, we have a life we we work and uh, uh, do activities that we love and things like that and then we come on retreat and it's completely completely different so it's a big transition and usually the first day is, is a little bit like that it's a little bit um, adjusting adjusting to the new place usually people don't really have a good night the first night and then a little bit tired so it's all good, it's okay, and it's, it actually happens pretty much every retreat. So there's no, it's not a special thing. So don't worry. And that brings me to think about, it, it's really like, um, I, used to, I used to plant trees, and one of my favorite stories when I was young was, uh, a story called The Man Who Planted Trees, L'Homme Qui Planted Des Arbres, the Jean Dion. And we have some French speaking meditators in the crowd, so that's good. He's a French author. author. And um, basically, it's the story of this man, uh, Elzear Bouvier, who was in the Alps and uh, living with very little in a very dry, arid area of the, of the Alps. And what he would do, he, he would have a very simple lifestyle and every day he would set out with his goats or sheep, I can't remember. <laughs> and he would go out with his stick and plant some seeds that he had and he would, one by one, always just make sure that he would find the best place for them usually in a hollow where the water would be more likely to come and then uh, he would plant with a stick and then move on and then plant another seed and plant another seed and of course when you do that you don't look back and expect to see trees already growing so uh, it's it's a labor of love and it's a labor of faith because at the beginning we can't always see the the product in the the end result of what we're doing right away but I just think this is such a beautiful story because he kept on planting for so many years and so many years and he he was very satisfied with this simple lifestyle and and over the years this other person who came to visit him I came to visit after many years and saw that now in this same place where it used to be completely dry and completely desert-like with abandoned houses, people actually started to move back in. There was forest, there was creeks were running again because the ecosystem with the trees growing that this man had planted so many years ago had started to shade off the ground and keep the moisture so then the, the creek started running again and life came back to this area and for me this is such a beautiful analogy for what we are doing here this is what we're doing right now we day one is usually we, we feel like we're kind of you know trudging along the desert and 
trying to plant some seeds and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And, and that's completely normal. But the trick is, here is to, to keep going, to continue, don't stop. It's not because you don't see it happening that it's not going to happen. And so it takes some time for us to start to have the result, the return of action into our investment in wholesome states. So the love and the joy, they will start to stick after a while. It won't be just like these drops that we feel, they fall on the ground and it just evaporates in this kind of heat of hindrances or distractions of the mind. It's like you have a little droplet of love and then joy and then it vaporizes because the mind gets distracted. Slowly, slowly, as we keep planting, as the plants start growing, then uh, the ecosystem starts to grow and we will start that, to see that these states become uh, rooted within us and then they start to stick and they stay for longer and then longer and then longer. And so this is this beautiful process that we uh, are doing which I call, we call the six R's, right effort, wise practice, the heart of the path, which is feeding, nurturing this whole ecosystem. And the six R's are? Oh, recognize. recognize. We got a specialist here. <laughs> Good. We have one. You can only say one. That's the, okay. Release, very good, very good. Relax, yes, that's a big one. Re-smile, very good. Vajira, come on. <laughs> Maybe uh, Lin? Return, rest, return, yes, yes. Both are good, both are good. Very good. And the sixth, repeat. Very good, very good. So recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return to love, and then repeat. Roll your arms. And so, these, um, these two are broken in, into two parts that I, I like to say, that I, I like to see it that way anyways, because I see two parts, two main parts to right effort, wise practice, and that's what I call the two wings of awakening. And one is to let go and relax, and the other one is to uplift the mind with joy and loving kindness. And it's also kind of like the, the movements that we have to do. One is to let go and relax the unwholesome states, the distractions that come with tension. And to lift up your wings and uplift the mind also. And so these, they kind of come together. And whenever the mind is distracted, we just have to kind of beat our wings a little bit. And then we glide, glide on the metta for as long as we can, because that's a little bit what we're trying to do. We're, we're not necessarily trying to always beat our wings, always do the six hours over and over again, because that would be tiresome. That would be a hindrance, basically. The six hours are meant to be something that is freeing, releasing, not something that is kind of weighing us down. So we beat our wings whenever we need to, and then we glide on the metta, or on our subject of meditation. And so, it always begins with discernment, as, as some of you might know in the, in the suttas, if you, if you read the original texts of the, the Buddha, 
And for those of you who are new, I don't know what was your channel to come here. And so uh, maybe you know, maybe you don't know, but during my talks every evening, I will always refer back to the original texts of the Buddha um, in a gentle way. Uh, I will increasingly uh, kind of uh, go into uh, the original sayings of the Buddha and pull out some information that we need. Um, for me, it's, it's something that I find very inspiring to have the wisdom of the Buddha uh, with, with us all the time and also uh, to integrate it into a more kind of a living context. So just so you know, uh, the words of the Buddha uh, have been preserved in the oral tradition for 300 years and then put down on paper for the rest for 2,300 years basically until now and uh, we still have these teachings today and that is just quite an amazing thing in itself and so just so so you know the format is usually centered around that there will be some kind of a teaching from the Buddha and then I will kind of offer some personal stories or um, imagery around that or exercises. And so some of you probably already know that it, al it always starts with discernment, the way that we see things, wise understanding or right view, basically. Because it's all a matter, a matter of mental standpoint, how we perceive things, basically. Um, I I really like this image at some point. It was, um, it was quite funny. It was this church and they were very well intentioned, um, but they had this huge sign over the church saying, you matter, don't give up. But if you read it from left to right, it says, you don't matter, give up. <laughs> <laughs> so they were really well intentioned but it's all a matter of perspective if you read it from left to right it's completely different it's the opposite message and so sometimes it's just a matter of the, what, how we see things and one of the first things that we really need to understand in meditation is like why, why do we practice meditation um, does that, anybody have a have an idea? <laughs> yes. Become more happy. Become more happy. That sounds really good. That sounds like exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> good. And if you think that's not related to the Buddha's teaching, well, actually, what could the end of suffering be if not happiness. I mean, we can play with words, but really the end of suffering, what's left after there's no more unpleasantness. There's liberation, there's happiness. And so meditation is, is for happiness. It is the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths are to see what is unhappiness and to work towards what is liberating and happiness. That is the Eightfold Path and the release from, from all dukkha, the release from tension, from um, dissatisfaction. We will go deeper into these things later, but... Um, and one thing that we, that we need to understand that, that, that is at the core of the Buddha's teaching, the essence of the Buddha's teaching, is the nature of mental states and that there are two very distinct kinds of mental states wholesome ones and unwholesome ones anybody has any idea of unwholesome mental states examples I'm making you work tonight yes Being? Being critical to yourself. Yes. Critical to yourself. Judgmental. Yes. 
Mm-hmm. Very good. Very good. Anger. Anger. Yes. Yes. What is in Singala? Tadai. Tarai. Tarai. <laughs> yes, anger is a big one. Judgment, being judgmental, criticizing, any other ideas. Anxiety. Very good. That's very spot on. That's a big one nowadays too, isn't it? Anxiety, stress. You have so much. I mean, we live in a wonderful era where you know we have so much that we can tap into like um, communication technologies and all that but then also it has an impact on our minds and we live s such fast paces of life that anxiety is is a major issue nowadays there seems to be no kind of calm place sometimes yes and what would be wholesome states Universal love. Yes, very good. <laughs> mm. Maybe two other ones? Kindness. 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 Very good. <laughs> Mr. at the back here probably has an idea. Pum Punctuality, that would be a wholesome state, venerable. <laughs> yeah, good. Yes, the Brahma Viharas. So for you, uh, for those of you who don't know what the Brahma Viharas stand for, these are like the celestial abiding, the divine abiding of the heart that the Buddha described as some of the highest qualities of mind and heart that humans can produce or experience. That is metta, loving kindness, karuna, compassion, mudita, sympathetic joy or just joy, and mental calm, equanimity, poise, poise of mind, basically. And usually these are not only these qualities, but they are uh, meant to be also radiant and uh, universal, boundless, as, as we practice them. And this practice is actually centered around these four, especially at the, at the beginning. So you will see as we progress. But that's very good. Um, I would... I really like to see this image uh, a, a simile occurred to me, never heard before. <laughs> and um, I, I, I have been, because of my uh, background, I said I was planting trees for a, uh, a while, and actually that was one of my main, uh, main uh, work. And I got to see how because I spent so much time outside, uh, also studied to be an adventure guide. So basically, I'm, uh, I spent pretty much a lot of my life out outdoors uh, in, in the forest or whatever it was on the river. And I noticed a lot how nature uh, happens, <laughs> basically how ecosystems interact and how uh, life grows and I spent a lot of time on cut blocks where we shaved off all the trees humans just came in and took all the trees down and to see how life comes back up afterwards and usually um, the first thing that I've noticed which uh, was always fascinating to me is that Somehow, where is, there is water, that is always where plants will grow first because that's where they can get their, the water from. 
And also the first plants that will come and grow over them are really protective plants. And I, I learned the hard way. I was walking through my piece of land and planting, that, planting it and uh, walking through a devil's club, which is like um, spikes like this. And uh, you know, you, it's really hard and it has really big leaves so that it protects the water and then it covers it and it keeps it shady so that it doesn't just evaporate because when we cut down all the trees one of the things that happen is that that piece of land becomes very very dry as soon as the rain falls then it just evaporates because there's nothing to keep it there there's nothing to keep the moisture in and plants have a really interesting way of just collecting water and that's I think is one of the most beautiful ways of thinking of wholesome states of mind is that these wholesome states of mind they have these naturally they have this kind of leaf like uh, nature where the rain falls on them and they are made in such a way that water kind of trickles and pool to the middle and the water collects and then it will usually run down the spine, the, the stem, and then go down and feed the roots. So plants look kind of uh, innocent and uh, simple, but they are quite, quite evolved and quite smart in, in their own ways. And it's the same thing with wholesome mental states. When you deploy loving kindness in your heart it does the same thing with your awareness your awareness starts to trickle in and it starts to pool and it starts to feed the root the body and it suffuses the body and the reason why it does this is because it's pleasant wholesome states are pleasant in nature love compassion joy these states are states that we can abide in very easily and there is no need for us to seek things outward because we're happy here and now and so as we cultivate them the mind just naturally becomes still it becomes calm and the water of our awareness starts to trickle in and pool and this is what we call samadhi this is how I see samadhi happening in the Buddha's teaching. Samadhi is that famous word that is called usually concentration. But personally, exactly how I described it, I feel it closer to be the pooling of awareness, the unifying of the water of awareness, which nurtures the root, roots afterwards. And this is why every morning we are reading the natural collectedness sequence that from uh, knowing that the hindrances, the distractions have been abandoned as we practice the six hours, we let them go. Then there is relief, gladness, pamoja. Then from that relief comes joy, piti. And from that joy comes calm, pasali. And then when the body is calm and the mind is joyful, uplifted, basically, one experiences happiness because there's nothing else to be experienced. It's just a blissful state. And then the mind becomes collected by nature. We don't have to force it. It just happens. And that's another way that we can actually translate the word Dhamma. Dhamma also means nature, the way that things work, the way nature happens. And so this is a samadhi, a way, a meditation that comes through wisdom and not force. Because there are other ways that we can make the mind unified or one-pointed through force, but this is not the, the, this one. This one is about stepping out, releasing, relaxing, cultivating joy. And so maybe let's take a few minutes and just take a few moments 
The first one won't be long because it's about unwholesome states, but I just want to have a general everybody experiencing. Just take a few moments and just remember anger. Remember a state of anger. Some, somebody said something to you you didn't like. And feel your body. How does it feel in your body? Tangible. And somebody really pushed their limits with you and really wasn't nice at all. How do you feel? And how is the mind? What is the mind doing? Just take a few moments. Can anybody share their what they're feeling in, in their body somatically? Yes. Constrictness. Const constricted. Constricted. Yes, yes, very much. For me, I feel a pinch in the heart, like a, like a squeeze. Constrictness, yeah. What happens to the temperature? Goes up, uh huh. Heat flush. I, I think that's one of the things that happens, you can tell. <laughs> so was, is that pleasant? Is, is, it, is it a pleasant experience? Yeah, no, not really. And how about stress and anxiety? It's like, uh, and you, we notice the body posture of people that are really anxious and stressed is usually like this. It's not actually open. And it's really kind of... Uh, it's like the heart is kind of sinking in, right? And, and you can actually tangibly feel it, and the body becomes clenched. Okay, we stop this recollection now. It's just for the purpose of comparing. And what about now if you were to feel love? Take a few moments. Remembering a time you were very happy, people you love, maybe some animals. And so how does that feel? That there was a question mark at the end of my sentence. That was a question for you to answer. Bajira, he wants to answer. Painting? Oh, pleasant. Pleasant, yes. Yes, very good. Pleasant, yes. And now we have the anxiety going like this and love is kind of like the opposite, right? It feels like, ah, it's liberating. It's opening. Is it heavy? No, it's not so heavy. It feels buoyant. It feels like, ah, 
it's very nice, it's pleasant. You could stay there. The anger and anxiety has this kind of tinge of there's nowhere to settle. The mind isn't, it's not able to, you know, be calm. It's always agitated. It's always wanting to kind of evaporate. Whereas the love and joy is uplifting and it's gathering and it's opening. And this is really at the core of the Buddha's awakening even. Because all the, what the Buddha taught was mainly something called bhavana. And bhavana means basically wholesome mental development. It is sometimes translated as meditation, but it's much more than, much more than just meditation per se. Uh, bhavana involves really a whole spectrum of cultivation of wholesome states, and it doesn't need to be sitting down. It's actually a constantly occurring thing. With every thought that we have, every intention, we are actually programming our own minds to be the way that we are actually programming it to be. So when we, when we become angry all the time and we lose our temper, that's how we're programming our mind. This is the, the natural reaction that we're going to have. This is the perspective that we're developing. Like if you were to read, uh, you don't matter, give up. But if you choose to read, you matter, don't give up. If you choose to cultivate wholesome states, then that's how you're going to react, that's how you're going to perceive life. And so there's a sutta called Breaking Free, where the Buddha says, Here monks, one reflects upon distractions, the distractions in the mind, which is usually mainly uh, wanting something else, wanting something outside, pushing away, not liking, dislike, and restlessness, basically anxiety. So these are the three main ones. The distracted mind does not rejoice. It is not clear. It is unsettled and unliberated. Then one reflects upon letting go and mental upliftment the mind that is uplifted, that lets go, it rejoices, it is clear, it is settled and liberated. Moreover, that mind is happy, well-developed, elevated, emancipated, and completely unshackled from distractions. And this is just simply in the nature of these states. We only have to choose. In this way, one becomes liberated from the obsessive and oppressive mental movements that arises from distractions, unwholesome states. And one does not experience those any longer. This is said to be the breaking free from mental distractions. That sutta is called breaking free, basically. I um, cherish that sutta quite a bit because it's so clear the Buddha just puts it on the table, on a plate for us, and says, Here, this is not for your own good, and this is for your own good. And then take these and cultivate that. So that's very easy. So that covers, where were we? Oh, I just started talking about the six R's, and so just so I make sure everybody's following, that was discernment we were talking about discernment were we and that would be what's the first r recognizing yeah recognizing discerning recognizing so a matter of perspectives don't worry out i won't be as long for each of them <laughs> but to see things in the proper way for what they really are in that their true nature it's so important for us to understand and then the rest will just go easily because when we understand the nature of wholesome states and unwholesome states we know what to do with them and that's what is following then the release is basically 
now I should ask you the question, what do you think is the difference between the release and the relax? I gave the answer yesterday. I know Metananda wasn't listening. <laughs> Ah, release is mental, relax is physical. Does everybody agree with what he's saying? Because you can't just make that a status quo, just like one person like that. <laughs> okay, yeah, maybe, maybe. Okay, yeah. Yes, and, and the reason why is that there's... <laughs> If we only keep it, there, there's two sides to the letting go, to the release, and that is called nekama. Nekama is not just uh, renunciation and uh, relinquishment, it's also letting go. It's that aspect of you know, viveka, nekama, it's very close together. And in this regard, we have two aspects that we have to deal with deal with nama and rupa we have mind and body basically and to only release it mentally to just say oh i won't pay attention to the to the distraction anymore and go back to loving kindness the thing with that is that it's more subtle than this and we have to go through the body because uh, Otherwise, it remains as a mental game, and we only play with the mind, and we don't actually fully let go of the hindrance. And actually, nowadays, it is even, uh, it's becoming more and more uh, popular and white, uh, mainstream. Uh, even the trauma, trauma therapy goes, to, uh, goes through the body a lot, more than, more than the mind only. Now, there's a, a lot of uh, techniques some uh, one of them is called somatic experiencing where people who have very severe trauma will not be like the psychologist route doesn't work very well they have to actually start to experience the trauma in their body how it feels because then they can actually connect with it otherwise the mind is is it's not able to identify it's not it's too subtle and when we connect with the body, we can actually have a chance at really letting it go completely. So that's why uh, the, Buddha, the Buddha was a genius. He, he already knew that. He already knew that 2,600 years ago. And uh, he understood the way, the connection, the importance of being aware of our bodies. All of these emotional states, whether wholesome or unwholesome, we experience them in the body. This is in traditional Chinese medicine also. Um, you, every parts of the body have, you know, when you feel anger, you feel it. Um, uh, there's, there's specific places in your body where we store these emotions as well. And so people that have a lot of anger will be more, I think it's kidneys or something like that. And uh, hmm? liver, yes, liver, sorry, yes liver and when you when you're angry you feel it in your gut huh? it's like that gut gut kind of dropping feeling well it, it has an impact on our body and the way that we we can be fully conscious of these states is really coming back to the body so the release um, this is from a, a sutta that is called the all the distractions Majjhima number two so we have very advanced, advanced people on the path of meditation and we have people that are also beginning. So I'm, I will try to bring the two together in harmony. Um, but if I mention about suttas, the original teachings of the Buddha, don't, don't worry, it's all good. Uh, I know some people would like to have the reference and, uh, uh, and you don't have to memorize that, it's just... Just keep it light. You don't have to think about it too much. So this is in number two, Majmanikaya, Sabbasava Sutta. And I, I, I feel like this is the place where we can find the most accurate uh, um, 
kind of paragraph that really uh, talks about the release step, basically. And he says, reflecting wisely, when a distraction comes up, one does not continue along with it. So we stop feeding it our awareness, basically. One abandons it, releases it, lets it go, and undoes it, and brings it to an end. So basically, what we put our awareness on, that grows. So if we keep going, if we start thinking about something that we're going to do after the retreat, some, something that somebody said to us, and then we keep diving into this, we keep feeding into that, then we actually give it more power. And this is what is going to grow. But at some point, we'll remember, oh, right, I'm meditating. And then we release. We release that. We stop giving it our power, basically. That's, that's all it is. And then coming back to loving kindness. And basically the, the, main, the main source for, for the relaxed step, I find, is in the Anapanasati Sutta, the mindfulness of breathing, or uh, yeah, where the, the Buddha talks about really going to the body and relaxing all the kaya sankaras. Uh, Pasambayam, Kaya Sankara. So, and this, this technique, the six R's were discovered or kind of crafted by our teacher, my teacher, uh, Bhante Vimalaramsi, when he actually went to a cave in Thailand and started to read the suttas. And one of the main suttas was the Anapanasati. And he started to actually do, practice these. Uh, each of these steps and he um, not the way that they're being taught today necessarily but the way that the Buddha explained it and that was really uh, eye-opening for him uh, to the point where he wanted to call this meditation the oh wow meditation <laughs> because he couldn't believe how deep his meditation started to go when he actually started to release and relax the tension in his whole body being aware of his whole body and then bringing up joy bringing up happiness because these are the steps that we overlook so much but they are the second two steps so piti patisamvedi sukham patisamvedi so very important so this was only for the the, the the sutta, the sutta nerds, the, <laughs> the, the, the discourses of the Buddha. And now re-smiling, this is... <laughs> Sometimes people wonder, uh, what's that smiling thing all about? And uh, there's, there's sometimes a, a little bit of friction there uh, for, for people just starting uh, on this path. Because... Uh, we have an idea that meditation is supposed to be kind of serious or just like uh, it's, it should be solemn at least <laughs> and uh, but like I said the, the following two steps in, in one of the most in the foremost uh, meditation teaching that the Buddha gave was actually in the Anapanasati was to actually bring up joy like literally not just not just in a way that it would happen kind of haphazardly uh, out of some kind of magical thing that happened through uh, uh, things that are unattainable. It's just bringing up joy, bringing up happiness. And to do that also calms the, calms the mind, calms the body. And I like here um, this advice from the Buddha, very direct advice. Uh, on meditation itself. Here on Ananda, one meditates aware of, here's a little tweak, of boundless love, intent, fully aware and present, letting go of tensions and distractions. But as we do this, bodily discomfort arises. There's something, sometimes something will happen, a little bit of pain. One's mind becomes lazy. Does that sound familiar today? Anybody got some one of those? <laughs> uh, 
Good. Good. Or distracted outwardly, started to think about this, think about that. Uh, rainbows and unicorns and waterfalls. We had somebody... <laughs> I'll say that later, the dolphin story. <laughs> we had somebody in the, in the previous retreat taking a, a dolphin as their spiritual friend. I thought it was so great. <laughs> so, as this happened, when, when you're meditating with boundless love, with your spiritual friend, well, at some point or another, whether it's five minutes, whether it's two seconds, the mind will just become distracted. And that's okay, that's normal. And here's what the Buddha says what to do. Then one should apply one's mind to an uplifting object. What could that be? <laughs> A dolphin? <laughs> that would work, yes. Yes, anything, but mainly right now, a lot of people are practicing with a spiritual friend. Isn't that an uplifting object? That would, I think that would qualify. By doing so, gladness arises. It's, it's, it's lovely. It's uplifting. From that gladness comes joy. And as you, we do that continually, you'll feel there is some, some light joy starts to come. Joyful in mind, one's body is relaxed. Relaxed in body, one experiences happiness or ease. And a happy mind becomes collected naturally. And in Pali, this is Sukhino Chittang Samadhyati. And this is how the Buddha said in black and white, in his own words, how the mind gets collected. How the mind gets samadhi, basically. Sukhino chittam samadhi By ease, by happiness. Through the, and these are the seven supports of awakening, by the way, that are just lining up. Again, for the nerds in the room. Uh, <laughs> I will be talking more about the seven supports of awakening later. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing subject, but basically the natural collectedness of mind, the verse that we read in the morning, this is the seven supports of awakening. I'll, I will break it down more uh, uh, clearly later. Uh, one thing that is really interesting about, uh, because some people are really, uh, really stubborn about not believing in the joy being a very important part of the path. And um, Actually, there was uh, studies made, and it all sprouted from a hypothesis call, called the facial feedback hypothesis, which was elaborated by um, Charles Darwin and William James, which explained that not only do our mental states affect uh, certain parts of our body, uh, like the facial expressions especially but also these facial expressions when we do them they also have the same impact on our brain so basically to do these facial expressions with uh, without the prior um, mental states would induce that mental state basically and they made a few a few studies and one of them was um, basically um, emotional faces and bio motion. So basically what they did is that they took two groups and they divided them and they gave a pen to everybody and in one group they put the pen like this and you can see tight-lipped frowning like this and uh, in the other group, people put the pen like this. And the result was that people that held the pen in a frowny kind of way actually saw life in a much more uh, negative way. Whereas to the people that held the pen like this, 
actually saw life in a very positive, happy way. And so that was uh, really interesting because there's nothing to do, you know, uh, people that were holding the pen like this, it's not like they're necessarily happy. <laughs> they, could be, they, they could be experiencing any kind of mental state. But um, this, this led to the conclusion that um, actually you can, even if you do that all the time, and if you smile, and if, even if you don't believe in it, it'll get to you eventually. And so keep smiling and keep, keep your, the corners of your mouth raised because it's telling your brain to be happy. It's telling your brain to be uplifted, your mind to be uplifted. And they call it the fake it till you make it approach. So, <laughs> and you'll see after a few days it really gets to you and it really works. We really put a lot of emphasis on that because it's really important. You will see your meditation will take off and fly if you smile all the time. If you, if you notice the mind gets serious and starts to really become kind of heavy and tensed, just laugh. Just laugh at the mind. Just why are you becoming so serious? Did you wake up this morning and said, like, I haven't felt like terrible in a long time. I should probably do it now. That would be nice. No, nobody's that crazy. When the mind is, starts to get serious, it's just because it's a habit of the mind. It's nothing more. And how do you change that habit? You just laugh at it. It's all good. Mind, and then mind will start to change. The whole perspective will start to change. And then the smile, will, I call it the perma smile. People start to have a perma smile. And it's really hard to shake off after a few days of training you know, on this retreat you will get there and then meditation will become so easy when you're happy when you're enjoying your meditation you're unstoppable nobody's gonna be able to stop you because you just enjoy it it's just it's just lovely you just close your eyes you have the love in your heart you have a smile on your face and it's all happening on its own. It's very easy and the mind gets collected. And so where are we now in, the, in our six R's? Drawing to the end. So that was, what were we talking about? Geez, I thought you guys were listening. <laughs> We're just, were we just talking about smiling, maybe? Oh, right. Okay. okay. So that would be re-smiling? Okay. And then what would be the next one? Return. Yes. Okay. Someone's listening. Good. <laughs> Saving everybody. <laughs> so obviously the return is to return back to loving kindness to rest back into the loving kindness. I'm not I'm not going to go into great details about this one because it's quite straightforward. We spent already quite a bit of time and uh, the guided meditations every morning will are meant to be taking care of that aspect. So resting back into the feeling of love. And the sixth are You can't answer. Repeat. Ah, very good. And repeating is uh, mainly something... This is virya, basically. If you want to have the real Pali term. Virya is often called uh, effort. But I like to see it as more devotion. Being devoted to wholesome states. Being devoted to the practice, to right effort. And so repeating is not just repeating the six R's all the time. As we said, this is not the goal of the six R's. But repeating is um, to be devoted, to be uh, continually practicing, 
So when you're standing up, when you're walking around, to be devoted to wholesome space, to love, to the smile, to the joy. Like, like my teacher would say, it's the first day blues. We're, we're, tr we're transitioning, we're coming down into retreat mode. Be kind to yourself. I just want to remind everybody, you know, wherever you came from, if you're tired, uh, like, you know, retreat schedules can look a bit, you know, we wake up early and some people are not used to that. Uh, if you need to take a nap, just go take a nap. If you, you know, if, if, if you're really tired or something like that, just be kind to yourself. Take, take really good care of yourself, okay? Because this, this meditation is so much better when you're actually comfortable, when you're actually uh, feeling good. So I just want to make sure everybody, okay. And in this idea of not giving up and having faith that what you're doing now is going to bear fruit, just allow it to grow a little bit. Um, this is a lovely little story that one of my teachers, uh, Doug Craft, uh, used to tell his students on retreat, especially the first day. It's uh, Venerable Metananda's uh, favorite bedtime story. <laughs> and it's called The Garden by Frog and Toad. Frog was in his garden. Toad came walking by. What a fine garden you have, Frog, he said. Yes, said Frog, it is very nice, but it was hard work. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. I wish I had a garden too, said Toad. Here are some flower seeds. Plant them in the ground, said Frog, and soon you will have a garden too. How soon, asked Toad. Quite soon, said Frog. Toad ran home. He planted the flower seeds. Now seeds, said Toad, start growing. Toad walked up and down a few times. The seeds did not start to grow. Toad put his head close to the ground and said loudly, Now seeds start growing. Toad looked at the ground again. The seeds did not start to grow. Toad put his head really close to the ground and shouted, Now seeds start growing. Frog came running up the path. What is all that noise, he asked. My seeds will not grow, said Toad. You're shouting too much, said Frog. These four seeds are afraid to grow. My seeds are afraid to grow, asked Toad. Of course, said Frog. Leave them alone for a few days. Let the sun shine on them. Let the rain fall on them. Soon your seeds will start to grow. That night, Toad looked out of his window. Drat, said Toad. My seeds have not started to grow. They must be afraid of the dark. Toad went up to his garden with some candles. I will read the seeds a story, said Toad. Then they will not be afraid. Toad read a long story to his seeds. All the next day, Toad sang songs to his seeds. And all the next day, Toad read poems to his seeds. And all the next day, Toad played music for his seeds. Toad looked at the ground. The seeds still, not did, the seeds still did not start to grow. What shall I do, cried Toad? These must be the most frightened seeds in the whole world. Then Toad felt very tired and he fell asleep. Toad, Toad, wake up, said Frog. Look at your garden. Toad looked at his garden. 
little green plants were coming out of the ground. At last, shouted Toad, my seeds have stopped being afraid to grow. And now you will have a nice garden too, said Frog. Yes, said Toad, but you were right, Frog. It was hard work. So on this, keep practicing, keep meditating. Don't look back to see if your seeds are starting to grow. Just enjoy the meditation, keep smiling, keep loving your spiritual friend, and you will see it will just happen by nature. <laughs> on this, I wish you a beautiful evening, beautiful night, and let's share merits, and I will be by the way, the merits are in the Puja book, page 213. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Leave it home for the coastline. Some place under the sun I feel my heart for the first time Cause now I'm moving on, yeah I'm moving on